Hey guys, so today I have a really special guest coming onto the channel, Luca Lampariello. How are you doing today, Luca? Doing fine. We're apart from the coronavirus, but everything is great. Just stay oh, home. Cool. Yeah. You're safe. <laughs> yeah, as we were saying, perfect time to take a few hours and talk about language learning. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, Luca probably doesn't need an introduction, but just in case there's anyone out there who's uh, completely new to you, why don't you uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm Luca, Luca Napariello, and I'm Italian. I'm from Rome, and I actually, I'm currently working as a, as a language coach. Language learning is my passion, my work, and my mission. I have a YouTube channel, which is called Luca Lampariello, and I also have a website, lucalampariello.com, in which I share my tips and knowledge and know-how about how to acquire a second language or many languages. Awesome, awesome. And, and how, how many languages have you uh, tackled at this point? Um, when people ask me how many languages I speak, it's a good question because you, you, you ask me how many languages have you tackled. You haven't asked me how many languages I speak. There's a big difference. Um, I have been learning 14 languages and uh, I would put Latin as well as the 15th language I've, I've learned at school, but obviously I don't speak it anymore uh, and... I do remember how it works, but I will not consider it as a language I speak as of now. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And so and one of the, the language that we're speaking in right now is is uh, one of the languages that you've studied. So it's kind of a, you know, indeed pr proof is in the pudding, so to speak. So um, so there is a lot of kind of technical topics that I, I want to get into, but I thought it'd be interesting to start off with the kind of motivational aspects of you know, why we learn a language, what motivates us to learn a language. And so if you were just going to answer the simple question, why do you learn languages? What would you say? I think that I learn languages because I see languages as a, a tools and a means to be the better version of myself every day. I think that language learning is great in and of itself. And I was excited when I was a little bit younger about learning new languages and being able to use them. I'm still excited now, but I didn't see the bigger picture. And for me, the bigger picture is that if you speak more languages, you are a person who understands better how reality works. Obviously, reality is, is very complex. And, but I think that the more tools you have at your disposal, uh, the better. And I definitely think that language learning is one of those tools that can open doors. And it's not just, you know, it, usually people say, if you speak more languages, you can you have more opportunities in life. You can get a job. You can, uh, you can travel, et cetera, et cetera. I do think that all these things are great. But I think that language learning has changed me as a person, as a citizen of the world. I see all these barriers that we have uh, of misunderstandings uh, among countries of cultural differences. And I see that I, I truly believe that when you speak a lot of languages, um, you can understand it. Languages become bridges. They're not barriers anymore. And and I also believe that speaking English is great, uh, don't get me wrong, but the more languages you speak, the better you understand others and you understand yourself. And uh, there's another thing that motivates me a lot, uh, motivates me more and more right now, much more than it did before, and it is that you, through language learning, I have understood a number of other things that don't have necessarily to do with language learning. One thing is, for example, that our language education, not just language education, but the education in general is not on par with how, with the current technology that we have nowadays and how things are taught. And I have figured out that most people have everything they can think of to learn any language in the world and to talk to anybody, but they do not have the know-how. That's the reason why they contact me, a surprising number of people who live, I don't know, just an example in say Germany and they want to learn German, they have everything. They have the internet. They have many possibilities, but they're, they're they are at a loss because they are they don't know how to they don't know how to do things. It's just the internet is a I, I call it is huge. It's a jungle. It's a dungeon, and you have to know to navigate it. If you have too much, there's a so-called paradox of choice. We have too too many things, and we do not know which one is good for us. So just to Definitely. get back question my motivation at the beginning it all started when I was uh, 12 and I remember that um, my uh, grandmother she was passionate about education in general and uh, I remember that when we were at this house that we used to have at the uh, you know near the the coast uh, 100 kilometers from Rome I was a 12 year old boy and she said why don't you come here and let's do some Latin let's do some French let's do 
some math. And that kind of started the whole thing. It was not just languages. It was just about knowledge. I still remember very clearly when she told me, you know, Luca, if you learn this stuff now and you learn how to learn, then you're going to have a great life. It was not about language learning and about being able to speak with all languages. It was a, um, you know, a global holistic change that she sparkled in me, so to speak. And that's what has been motivating me so far. When I decide to learn a language, there are some contingent reasons. Uh, for example, I don't know, I, I went and I had, a, I had a wonderful trip. I visited the country. But I think that the, the reason why I always start learning a language is because I'm conscious and I'm aware that every language that I speak is going to add a little bit more info, a little bit more, a few more experiences that are going to make me a better citizen of the world and a, a better human being because it, it also develops and, um, and enhances and improves the relationship that I have with myself and with my brain. Wow. Yeah. So that was a really awesome answer. And actually, you know, I have some questions written down that, that I prepared to ask you. And the next question that I, I was going to ask you, uh, probably one of the, the more um, not difficult questions, but, you know, kind of um, one of the questions that that I think I've always wanted to ask a polyglot, but I don't hear asked that very, very often. And you, you kind of already partially answered it. But, um, you know, I just want to preface this question by, by saying that, uh, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Clearly, I'm I'm a language learner myself, and so um, uh, don't don't just under understand. I'm just trying to trying to push things to in order to to hopefully you know get out, get out as much insight as possible. But so sometimes after having personally spent so much time learning Japanese and now trying to take on the challenge of Mandarin Chinese, something I feel is that fundamentally I'm kind of repeating the same process that I've already been through once. Like I've been through the process of learning Japanese and discovering a new culture, discovering a new language, retraining my brain to think in a different way. And of course, Chinese is completely different than Japanese, but on a kind of meta level, the process itself is kind of the same. And so, of course, I'm still growing a lot as a person by learning Chinese and discovering a new culture. But from the perspective of growing as a human being, it almost feels like as I was learning Japanese, I was making a sort of exponential type of growth. It was just really taking me into new territory that on on a literal level and almost on a meta level, right? That on when it comes to discovering a new culture and a new way of thinking that I've really never experienced before. And it really forced me to grow in a lot of ways. Whereas now when I'm learning Mandarin Chinese, it almost feels like it's more of a linear type of growth because although the content is completely different, the process as a whole is very similar. And so sometimes it feels like, do I really want to spend another couple thousand hours getting really good at Chinese? Or do I want to do something completely new, like a, a tackle a whole other field of study or try to acquire a whole other skill, learn a musical instrument or something like that? Maybe perhaps that would grow me more uh, as a human being uh, as a whole. And so how do you justify to yourself continue, continually studying languages over and over and over, kind of repeating that same meta process rather than doing something completely different and challenging with, with your time and effort? I think it's a very good question. Um, I would say that, first of all, the reason why... First, let me tell you, I've been wanting to, I've been telling myself that I wanted to learn to play the guitar for a long time. I started playing the piano like a long time ago and I just dropped it. And that is single-handedly the, the decision that I regret to this day because I really like music, not only listening to music. And I think that if you learn how to play an instrument, you see things in a different way, you interpret music in a different way. It adds another thing. Of course, you can keep listening to music for the rest of your life. But I think that Learning to play an instrument is an amazing thing. It is an amazing skill in and of itself to, to develop for your brain for a number of other reasons. Now, I always tell myself, and I try to justify the fact that when it comes to New Year's Eve, New Year uh, Eve's uh, resolutions, New Year's resolutions, sorry, uh, we always have, okay, <clears throat> I always tell myself, I'm going to learn to play the guitar, and then I end up learning another language. <laughs> I think that that's the path of the least resistance, meaning that I already know more or less what awaits me. And that's the reason why I most, most often than not, actually all the time, so <laughs> it's been the case, <laughs> I opt for uh, language learning. Um, and th this is the first part of the, uh, of the, I addressed the first part of the question. The other one is, um, I also think that, um, you know, learning languages learning a foreign language more or less follows the same patterns, but I also believe that every language that you learn offers different challenges, meaning that in the case of, of Japanese and Chinese, just to, uh, you know, name an example or two examples, 
it's true, while it's true that learning a language, when, when, once you develop your own method, you more or less know uh, what to do. It's also true that there are a lot of features in every language that are slightly different from the language you speak or the language or other languages you've learned, so your native language or other languages you have under your belt. And it's always kind of exciting um, to, uh, to learn another language. In my case, I made a video on YouTube some two, three months ago talking about my failure to learn Japanese. I well, speak very well, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I admire you for that. And a lot of people say that if you learn a language, if, once you've learned a bunch of languages, then it's easier and easier to learn. And I would say yes and no. Yes, because you know the process and you know you have developed a certain attitude towards learning languages. But on the other hand, there are languages that have a completely different structure up to that point. Uh, when I decided to tackle Japanese, I had just learned uh, so-called SVO languages, so subject, verb, object. Well, in Japanese, not only it is a SOV language, so mm -hmm. when you say something, you don't say, I'm eating an apple, but I, apple, eat, eat. Mm -hmm. but also there's a number, an incredible number of other features in Japanese that come from cultural references, gestures, situational, uh, you know, circumstances, that come with the, you know, you get the whole package. And I found myself in, in, in struggling with Japanese because I've always been using, maybe we're going to talk about this before or later, but I had always been using this so-called bidirectional uh, translation, using my mother, mm -hmm. mother tongue and the target language to translate back and forth. But in the case of Japanese, it didn't work that well and for other reasons. Um, so I, I, I would say, yes, it, it's true that on the one hand, once you've learned 14, 15, even 10, seven languages, then you can spend your time in a different way. But then it all, it, it all comes down to a personal choice. But learning other languages, it's still something exciting because it's, a, it's an intellectual challenge, especially when you tackle languages that are extremely different. I don't like the word difficult. I always use this term distance. A language is distant. Uh, from, as a language system is different from another system. And the overall distance is the sum of the distances between the single components, you know, just like grammar, pronunciation, etc. So I would say, I, why not just do this and that? I will keep languages, uh, I, keep, I will keep learning languages for the rest of my life, I think, because it's part of my mission, it's, it's what I believe in, but I'm thinking more and more that acquiring other skills is definitely something that is worth doing, learning how to dance Salsa, I don't know, uh, learning to play the guitar, that's the, the next mission that I want to tackle. Uh, or doing, uh, learning to program, learning, we, I, I've just figured out that in order to survive, I would say, um, in, in, uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you not only have to learn how to speak languages, you have to learn how to use the computer, you have to learn how to manage a team, mm -hmm. you have to learn how marketing works, you have to learn how the internet works, how to look for something. There's a number of other skills and sub-skills that you have to develop that, you know, it's, it's a challenge in and of itself. So while I keep learning languages, I also keep learning a bunch of other things. I'm surrounded by books, and I, one of the things I do all the time is reading in all languages. And um, so I, I, I keep learning languages is the main thing because it's my job, and I have, my life hinges on language learning. But I also, uh, maybe sometimes even unconsciously, I keep learning new skills and new things every single day. And I, I hope that by 2021, I will be uh, starting to play uh, the guitar, hopefully. Awesome. Not gonna awesome. Yeah, I mean, so, so many really good points that you brought up there that made me think so many things, like especially the point about how languages all present their own unique challenges. And so from a certain level, you could say, oh, well, I'm just learning languages over and over. But of course, when you really dive in and you look closely, every language is completely different. And I think this applies to all areas of life where these notions of how different or how similar something is, is completely relative. So a lot of things look the same when you're not looking very closely, right? Like a lot of kind of people in the United States might have this image that all Asian people pretty much are the same. You know, they all use chopsticks. They all have a similar looking face. Whereas, of course, my experience after diving into Japanese for so long is that Japanese people are completely different than Chinese people and Japanese people are completely different than Korean people. And so it, it's, it's yeah, it's a matter of perspective how different it is. So of course, when you really take link, like really dive in and you're look, taking a close look at languages, they're all completely different. And so they all are gonna be enriching in their own ways. And and the other kind of point up you brought up towards the end about how a language is a tool which you use to do other things like reading or communicating. And so you could be studying a language and be studying programming 
you could be studying a human language and a programming language at the, at the same time if you're using like you know a french book to learn programming and things like that so that's another interesting thing that i think makes language learning a little different than guitar because you can't really use guitar to learn programming if you know what i mean yeah, that's exactly right that's exactly right cool cool so now um kind of another thing i want yeah, to talk yeah. in the case of chinese and japanese which are languages we share um is that a lot of people say for example that if you already speak Chinese or if you already speak Japanese, then it's easier to learn uh, the other language. Yes and no, because of course, knowing characters does help in mm -hmm. the sense that you're, you can understand, you can read a text and understand it. If you speak Japanese and you, and you, you can uh, read the kanji, you can read possibly a text in Japanese and understand its meaning, but speaking or reading out loud, it's a completely different skill because the pronunciation is completely different. And in the case of Chinese, for example, when you tackle Chinese, yes, true, truth be told, Chinese has a relatively straightforward syntax, but when it comes to speaking, it still poses a lot of problems because you have to learn the tones. And most students I know learn tones backwards. They learn just the single tones and then they try to formulate the sentence, which is a nightmare. And I always say, I always take the example, imagine that you spoke your own native language, be it American, English, French, and Italian with tones, because we do have, it's called pitch contours, they're slightly different than mm -hmm. tones, but um, still we have, the, our pitch varies uh, you know, along each syllable, and you don't want to learn Italian that way, and that's exactly what they do, what, what students do when they learn Mandarin Chinese, not all of them, and I always advise that in order to learn Chinese, you have to, you know, you have to take tackle it in a different way. But that, you know, replying to your question before, it's still, like, even if you learned 10 languages, then Chinese would be a completely different challenge. And you have to, while you have, you can keep, you can stick to your routine, you, you, you know how to learn language, you still have to develop some sort of flexibility. I've realized this more and more in the last five years before when I tackled Japanese, that was in 20, 2011. I was convinced that the method I had I had developed was good for any language, and that is not necessarily true. So you can still keep a few things. I always believe in principles rather than methods. If you mm -hmm. follow principles, then the method will come as a consequence of that. And people are looking for the uh, the best method to learn the language. There's no one best method. There are methods that work and methods that don't work, and there are methods that work for you and methods that don't work for other people. If you have a method that worked and worked and has worked with uh, a bunch of languages, keep in mind that other languages that you still do not know and want to learn might pose certain challenges. And from the get-go, you should make sure that you develop, you think, you self-reflect, you ponder, the, you know, you think about the, the possibility of developing certain strategies. It's always trial and error. You try something, it doesn't work, try something else. And I think that spending a couple of hours or even 10 hours doing some reach, smart research, as I call it, uh, on the Internet, looking for some valuable advice on how to tackle the problem. Because for sure, on the Internet, you will find some people who have already tackled and try to tackle that problem and found a good, a good universal, maybe not good universal, but a good solution that might fit you. Then it, it might be well worth spending some time doing some research instead of you know, tackling that language head on thinking that you have the best method in the world and it works for every language. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I really like that idea of a principle versus a method, because I think principles are universal, right? Principles don't change from person to person or language to language, but methods, they do change per language to language and per person. I think preference plays a big role in what, what specific method is you're gonna do. You think of a method as an application of a principle. And so sometimes I talk to other language learners and we have different methods, but we understand the, the same principles. And so from our from my point of view, it's not a disagreement. It's just we have different styles, whereas from a new a newcomer's perspective, they might see that uh, the surface level differences and think that we're in a disagreement somehow. You know, the, the, the funny thing is I've been I've been witnessing a lot of debates and a lot of discussions about, oh, my method is the best or you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Namely, for example, the. Um, the topic about whether you should speak from the very beginning or you should speak after, uh, you know, mm -hmm. wait three, four months. I lean towards thinking, I lean towards the, uh, the first, I think that there was the first one was wait a little bit, just get input because without input, if something doesn't get inside your ears, then it can't get out of your mouth. That has been the case in, for a bunch of languages. 
But it's also true that I have learned to develop some flexibility um, in the sense that it also depends on a number of factors. It doesn't only depend on the language you're learning. It also depends on uh, a person's, the learner's background, the language, the distance between your native language and the foreign language. In my case, I waited maybe, I don't know, a lot of months. I waited maybe nine months to speak before I started speaking Portuguese, but then I realized I could have spoken it after three months because it was extremely similar, not only to my native Italian, but to a bunch of other Romance languages that I spoke. But again, um, everybody to each his own, meaning that if you want to speak from the very beginning, if you think that you can do that, and if you want to do that, well, just do it. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you, wait, you should get massive input. I do believe the massive input is key, not only at the beginning, but over the whole, overall, the whole process, because a lot of people think that you have to sit down and learn deliberately. That's fine. It, it, it speeds up the process. But what a lot of people disregard or neglect or maybe they don't know about, and myself included until, I don't know, a few years ago, is the unconscious or subconscious part of your brain. There's a lot of, there's a part of your, of your uh, brain circuitry that is, has to do with that. It's like subconscious learning. And the interesting part is not only that when we dream, we reorganize the pieces of information that we acquire during the day. But along, like with time, this information, all th these pieces of information that we get, you know, consciously and or unconsciously, willing or unwilling during the day and during our study, they coalesce, they, they basically settle, they, they, it just takes time for the brain to process stuff and learn. Maybe 10 months down the line, you're going to remember a word that you acquired like 10 months mm -hmm. prior, or you find yourself using words that has happened to me a lot of times using words that I was not even conscious of knowing, expressions, I say, where did this come from? Because the brain has a conscious part that's called the prefrontal cortex here, with which we, you know, the, the, the operative center, so to speak, but the all the other parts of the brain work in your favor if you, uh, if you listen a lot. I always, I love saying that language learning is an extremely complex entity that we learn easily, the human brain learns easily if you feed if you feed it the right way. And, and that is all the more true because we constantly see native speakers ma handling and mastering their own native language well because they follow this pattern. As native speakers, they require language through massive input and obviously massive exposure. But if you observe a five-year-old kid, they speak, they speak the language, for example. They don't know a lot of words, but they speak the language perfectly. They haven't internalized the patterns. And I think that adults learn I think the, the, the learning patterns, the learning, the lines along which people learn, both for first and second language acquisition are very similar, but there's obviously other differences. But the bottom line is the more input you get, the better, because if it doesn't show at the very beginning, I got a lot of students complaining about the fact that, oh, I've been learning the language, I've been listening to the language for three months, they still can't speak, and I tell them, wait a little bit more, you know, just like, let it get it, let it get in, let, let your brain do the work without stressing too much. Don't let your prefrontal cortex fight against the rest of your brain. Just get a lot of input. Then if you want to speak, just start speaking a little bit. And then, uh, you know, if you keep the, see it as a, you have the base of the pyramid, if the base of the pyramid, like the food pyramid, if that is input, be it in like watching, listening, always make sure that it's comprehensible, that you understand it. And then it's got to pay off in the in the short as well as in the long run. Yeah, totally. I couldn't agree more. You're pretty much preaching to the choir. And <laughs> like oh, with that, I, I deal with the input. Actually, this is a metaphor that they talk about in meditation, which is my other passion. But I think it applies perfectly to language learning is the idea that your when they say in meditation, your role in training your mind is that of a gardener where you plant the seed and then you cover it with good soil, you add the water, you add, make sure it has sunshine, and then you wait, and it grows on its own. And I think it's the same thing where your job is to set up the conditions to make sure you're getting enough input, and you know, you're, you're putting in the hours, and then the eventually things will happen on their own. It's not really you consciously the conscious entity that lives in the prefrontal cortex that's doing the learning. It's really you're just setting up the conditions. And I think what you said, sometimes it does, it takes uh, some time for the results to show up. It's the same thing. Like if you plant a, plant a seed and you water it, it's going to take a while before anything starts, starts to break up the surface and, and pop up.
but I think a, a lot of people, what they try to do is basically like stretch the plan or like pull it up the ground to try to force the, the growth to happen. But yeah, it doesn't, that's just going to be frustrating and not really productive. You, you can't force language learning. I mean, you can, you can spend 12 hours a day uh, learning a language, but it's still, your brain still needs time to learn. So you can force it. You can try to learn 12 hours. It's possible to do some intensive learning and it does pay off, but I think it's much better to relax. You can do, it's called distributed learning. You can spend uh, maybe one hour a day uh, learning a language and then it pays off. It's called the law of accumulation. So you do something every day. We don't see it. Normal human beings, we see it just a day, but if you stretch it in 350 days, then you see one hour a day is a lot of hours. Um, also, I love meditation. I started doing it two years ago, and I've been oh, doing awesome. it. Ever since. And I've developed, I've coined this um, um, this very interesting expression, which is language uh, awareness or a language mindfulness, which is basically, um, I think that meditation um, has very good effects reverberating over other you know aspects of my life. One of which is being present, being able to be language aware when you're language aware you're able to monitor your own speech production so as of now while i'm speaking i have i'm speaking through my prefrontal cortex you know i'm conscious and consciously trying to you know retrieve information retrieve words and and get uh, get a message out there but i am also able to monitor myself to see okay am i using the right words or sometimes i stop or speak a little bit more slowly so that i can find new words i've been teaching, I've been training my students in this and I've seen fantastic results. It's like people who are not conscious of some patterns that they use all the time, mistakes, etc. Say, for example, one thing that you can do, I always see language production as a skill that has a number of parameters that you can change, one of which is rhythm and speed. If you mm -hmm. slow down, you can actually al allow your brain to look for more patterns. When you speak a language extremely well, you do not follow just one pattern, one pattern of thought or one linguistic pattern that is just these words that you constantly resort to, but you also open a window through which you can see, oh, I, instead of saying choosing a word, opt for a word or other ways of expressing um, uh, the same concept or even formulating a concept in a, um, in an easier way, in a more clear way. So we do this, um, for example, in, our, in my coaching sessions, we do it in, uh, I call them production training, that is both for speaking and for writing. And when people are made aware of their speech production, be it in terms of pronunciation, intonation, choice of words, speed, rhythm, even facial features, some people are not aware of the facial features mm -hmm. they, they have, either when they talk or when they reply. For example, some people do like, oh, they do strange faces, they do not realize it. And um, I think that meditation has helped me being more aware of myself and being able to help other people be aware because when this is another big, you know, big topic within the language learning community is should we correct people or we shouldn't correct people when they speak? I believe the corrections are great, but they have, you have to develop a certain attitude. You have to be aware of some mm -hmm. things. And, and I think you also have to, have the feedback delivered in a certain way. But if you're aware of how you talk, and, and by, by talking and by communicating, I would say, it's not just what comes out of your mouth. It's the uh, your co-gestures, facial features, body position, reaction to the person who's talking, and obviously choice of words. So I constantly train people to learn how to speak, to use less words to get your point across, but most of all, to be present in the moment. Because when you're present in the moment, you realize the recurring patterns, the recurring false patterns, sometimes, oh, I made a mistake, that person, my tutor, corrected me a month ago, but I keep making that mistake. Some people, even if you tell them, you know, be mindful, et cetera, they don't care because they just want to communicate. There's, mm -hmm. you know, there's a different people to each his own, as I always say. But for those people who want to get better and better, because at a certain point you hit the so-called plateau and you uh, have a hard time improving, you will need to have uh, some strategies in place which allow you to hop from one point to the other. And I think that being mindful, being aware of your, not only of your speech production, but also of the speech production of the person or the people who are talking to you is going to make a huge difference. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And this is really pretty interesting uh, for me because I've thought a lot about how meditation can 
help with the language learning process. But usually I'm thinking of it in the context of input, how you can pay better attention to your input and absorb more. But everything you're saying makes perfect sense for output as well, that you can become more aware of the process of you speaking. And through doing that, you're giving yourself more opportunities to improve that process. And I know this has been my experience with meditation. I think one of the reasons why it's harder to sell meditation to, to people who haven't tried it yet is because one of the first things meditation teaches you is how unaware you are of what is going on in your own personal experience all the time. And it's only once you become aware of this unawareness that you see the value and you're motivated to actually try to improve how aware you are. Yeah. And, and two, two more things I wanted to say. The, the first one is that I do the, the first training I do is actually an input and then output. So I teach people to, I train people to notice stuff. And it, it mostly, I think the, the most important one is here is uh, pronunciation, intonation. Mm -hmm. People are not aware of stuff. And when you point that out to them, they go like, oh, my God. For one example, Italians have a falling tone on possibly always, almost always the last element of a sentence. So if you say, for example, la casa bianca, the white, the white house, you know, I said the white house. So if you fall on, if you see, I see a white house, then you fall on the last element like Italians. But the Italians would also say, oh, I saw the president of the United States in the White House, which is a mistake because mm -hmm. the, that, that, in that case, it's a compound. And when, a, when you have a compound, it is two words attached with one another. White House in this case, you stress white, you don't stress house. English has is extremely complex in this regard, much more so than Italian because you, you can say I – talk to the English teacher, I talk to the English teacher, it's two slightly different things. Italians mm -hmm. would not, would, they would not, they wouldn't, un, until you point that out to them, you would, they would not know. Or I, for example, there's this famous sentence that, um, you know, it's used in literature. I didn't steal the money. I didn't steal the money. I didn't steal the money. Three, the same, the same amount of words, the same order, the exact same sentence written, but the stress is different. It changes the meaning it changes completely changes the meaning of the word. Um, and as for the second thing, the interesting part about meditation is that we have again here two types of circuitry. We have the the circuitry that is in the moment, that is the sounds that we hear, the touch. And if you, for example, you follow some um, some some lectures of meditation, or you if you just do some uh, meditation training, you realize that the person talking to you is just telling you. Just pay attention in now, like uh, your your mm -hmm. body sitting, the pressure of your body. You, you don't think about it. There's a number of things happening right now that when I'm caught up in thoughts of my life, that's a narrative part. That's the other part. There's two parts. That's the present when you look at the, the you know dust and dawn, and you you're just there and you just contemplate the beauty of nature. And then there's the other all the nagging thoughts that you have about you, you as a person, the ego, your you know, the problems with taxes, language learning a girlfriend uh, who just dumped you or whatever. That's the other part. And when you're able to shut off and just completely uh, blot out, you know, the, eliminate that part for a second, you silence it for a second, and you realize that you have the power of being in the, in the present, in the now. And I think that I had maybe, I don't know about the other people, but I had the impression that meditation was just like, mm, and doing this. It is much totally. more that. It's a transformation uh, that is can really help you not only with the relationship you have with yourself, with language learning, it can help you with the relationship you have with certain people. Sometimes we find ourselves replying to some people because it's a it's a it's a reflex. We we have established a certain relationship with a person, so we we'll react to that person. The person says hi, you say hi back. Well, that's that's the obvious one. But uh, I don't know when when you get into a fight with a person you know, or you get into recurrent patterns. It's because we're not aware. We're just we're just caught, get caught in these patterns. But when you just for some like for three seconds, we take the time and think, oh, actually, I, I did this. This is an automatic gesture, or I reacted to that person, and you start pondering about the things that you do automatically. Then you can start changing them, and, and that's exactly the same thing with language learning. When somebody says that you make the same mistakes over and over, the, one of the reasons why is because people are giving the they're given the answer but they don't care. Their mind that flies over their head. They're thinking, they're caught in, get, I don't know, speaking or caught in something else. They don't just stop and say, oh, okay, let me try to find a way to integrate. You have to wait. A couple of seconds can make a huge difference, you know, in your life. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, so many extremely interesting things you said right there. And of course, I can relate to a lot of that, like the idea of like, yeah, you're saying that becoming more aware of what is actually happening in your moment to moment experience can really change your relationships to to yourself and to other people. And I know for me, this had a big effect in my language learning, because a lot of the challenge of language learning is psychological, right? It's just, in a way, I think that one thing that's a little bit different uh, when it comes to learning a language as compared to maybe learning guitar is that in a way there's more of a built-in goal, right? We have the goal of, I want to be able to speak the language. I want to be able to understand the language. I want to be fluent, whatever that means. Whereas when you're learning guitar, it's easier to just pick up a guitar and take the first step and not really think about where the final destination is. And so, uh, when we're learning a language, we have this goal, but then by looking at that goal, it's almost like looking into the sun, you know, it's too bright. And then we're you know, end up suffering due to becoming aware of the gap between where we are now and where we want to be. And I know for me, studying Chinese, I would have all these thoughts about like, oh man, I still understand so little. It's going to be so long until I get to where I want to be. Like, maybe I should change my study plan so that I can move, improve more quickly. But once I became able to just become aware of those thoughts and realize like, oh, that's not actually helpful because that's actually unhelpful because it's taking me out of the experience of just being with the Chinese. I was able to just let them go. And then not only was that more pleasant, but actually I was able to study a lot more. So sense. cool, cool. And so um, another thing that uh, one of the questions that I was planning on asking you la later on in the interview, but it sounds like pretty relevant now is the issue of kind of kind of already touched on it. But once you're already at a very high, comfortable level in the language, how can you stop from plateauing and continue to make strides towards kind of native like fluency. And one of the things that you're kind of touching on about how a lot of times we end up with these habits that we become totally um, oblivious to, I kind of have this theory where I, I think the brain is always trying to conserve energy. And so like what you're talking about how a lot of times we're totally unaware of the feeling of our feet on the ground and our butt on the chair and the ambient noise in the background. I think it's because the brain realizes it can just ignore these things and get sure. away with it. And so it's going to do that to free up more space for worrying about our life and taxes and things like that. And I think with language as well, once you get to a point where you can function in the language, you can express yourself, you can understand things, even though there might be many features of your own interlanguage that are lacking, your brain isn't really concerned about that because it doesn't seem to be causing any problems. So how, uh, you know, on a more concrete level, how can we go about overcoming this and continuing to make strides towards native like fluency? Um. I think that one of the things that is strictly necessary is <clears throat> to do some hard work, but let's, let's, let's expand on that. So hard work is like, like sounds like bet new. Um, the first thing is that as you pointed out, the brain, the brain as, as well as all the other parts of your body tend to conserve heat energy. So when you get to a certain point, the, the body has a certain reaction. An example of that is when you start running 30 for 30 minutes at the same speed, then you do not improve unless you do a little bit more or you change your rhythm uh, because the, the body adapts to the situation. And the same thing goes for uh, lifting weights or any other motory skill. Same thing goes for language learning because language learning is a skill that you develop and it's very similar to, it has more or less the same three stages of uh, the development of motory skills. So you go through the beginner, intermediate and advanced. Now, when we talk about that, it's necessary to give a little bit of, of background and you know about this is that what is a, what is a beginner? Who is a beginner? What does it mean that you are intermediate? Sometimes we use labels without being aware that these are just labels. They help us. We we human beings have the tendency to give labels to simplify a very complex world. We, we need to navigate a very complex world and, and model it somehow. Otherwise, it's got to be a little bit complicated. So we have invented this like three-tier um, you know, framework where we have these levels. But the reality is that it's a fuzzy change. You, know, you move from one, from one uh, level to the other without even knowing that. But the truth is that even if these are just labels, they help us establish that there is some sort of um, kind of uh, hierarchy in terms of skills. So I, I believe that it, it's helpful. I don't know whether how, <clears throat> how, um, how well uh, how efficiently it models reality. But the truth is, in order to move from one one skill to the other, I think that what you need to do, especially when you get caught up in, in the so-called plateau, is you have to lay out a strategy which allows you to uh, 
uh, progressively develop all your skills, the sub skills, the four sub skills, uh, in um, in a in a specific way. What do I mean by that? I don't know if you ever heard of the concept of deliberate practice, yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, there's a very famous uh, book. There's a few books that talk about the concept of deliberate practice. Uh, in particular, there is one. It's it's right there now. I can't say I don't have my contact lenses, but I think the the, the it's Peak, The Science of Expertise mm -hmm. by Erickson. He spends the entire book talking about how deliberate practice helps people achieve amazing results. And basically, deliberate practice is the following. Let's make it very concrete So, you know, in terms of language learning, but this applies to everything. Let's suppose that you get stuck in this so-called intermediate phase in, in language learning. You're learning, say, German, and you can hold conversations with, a, with your tutor, and you can have simple conversations sometimes a little bit more complex about some topics you like, but you feel like you cannot read books, you cannot enjoy magazines, and you still struggle when watching television. When in order to move, in order to improve your, uh, your skills, what you need to do is you need to have something that you need to de design some uh, strategies where the main goal is to improve your skills in a progressive way and in the following way. It, 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 it unfolds along the, the following lines. First of all, you need to get out of your comfort zone. An example is if you're reading, a, you know, simple articles, then you should try to read articles that are a little bit more complicated. They're a little bit more complex um, and, and not at, at your level, a little bit more so that you find yourself in what I call the Goldilocks of language learning. That is not too difficult. Goldilocks is this zone of habitable planets where it's not too hot. It's not too cold. So you can you can live in it. And in language learning, it's important to have the so-called desired difficulty. You want to you want to venture into unknown ground, but you don't want to you don't want to make the mistake of venturing into a total a totally unknown ground, so that you're tackling something that is so difficult that it's discouraging. So if you find yourself having difficulty with simple text, try to look for something that is a little bit more difficult, but it's comprehensible. Say a bilingual text, something that is a little bit more complex. That it's some there it's it's full of words that you don't know, but you can rely on uh, audio and um, your own native language in order to dissect and decode uh, the text. An example for for a reading, an example for listening is if you find it difficult, this is a very common problem of, I cannot understand, I cannot understand. Like it, it, the, the brain needs a lot of sampling. You need a lot of input for that. And so a common thing is, okay, just listen to the radio, listen to, watch television and it will happen. Yes and no. I still remember 10 years ago, a guy was watching television for 10 hours to learn Chinese. I think it was Mandarin Chinese. And I don't think that's a very good use of your time. If you do not understand anything, you will end up understanding more, but you have to go through comprehensible input. So by that, I mean that if you want to improve your listening comprehension, why don't you rely on, uh, you know, on audio that also has a transcript so that you can keep listening to the audio, but at the same time, you can actually understand it, which is a rewarding in and of itself. But you're getting out of your comfort zone because you're doing mm -hmm. something for the sake of improving your skills, both reading, listening, reading at the same time. If you have a hard time speaking, uh, this is this goes in all directions, obviously. If, if you have um, if you have a hard time speaking because you still do not speak well, so you, you have to take some baby steps in order to, you have to design a strategy so that you can uh, slowly but surely start speaking. Um, an example, let's suppose that a person goes to Germany, that this is happening with some of my students, they live in Germany, they cannot speak to people. I, I tell them, don't panic, just take a step back, uh, hire a tutor or talk to someone, a tandem, a friend of yours, start with very simple conversations, five minutes, uh, 10 minutes, and start rehearsing and trying getting out of your comfort zone within, you know, within a kind of a protected environment mm -hmm. where you have, you're getting out of your comfort zone area, you're trying to say things you cannot say. You have a person listening to you, so I call it feedback giver. It's really important to have feedback because, as I said before, you can be aware of the mistakes you make, but it's much easier to have someone correct you, develop the right attitude for it because that person is there to help you. So every time that whenever you can, you can record the conversation, you can listen to the conversation again, and then you can have that person jot down some mistakes that you make. That is deliberate practice. That is, you have 30 minutes of concentrated time with another person, you venture, you get out of your comfort zone, 
And you learn as a consequence of that. That entails time. It entails, uh, obviously, a little bit of concentration. And it entails some programming. Um, an interesting thing in terms of improving your, your speaking abilities is a lot of people, um, a surprising amount of people, just take a bunch of lessons and they tell themselves, okay, I'm just going to talk every single day, one hour in German, one hour in Japanese. And I just hop on a conversation on Skype and I make it happen. But they don't plan. They don't think about a topic they want to talk about. They don't record the conversation. They don't review. Deliberate practice at its best is to design a strategy where you know what you're doing. You have the right attitude. You walk in the conversation knowing exactly what you're going to talk about. You talk about something you like instead of having the tutor telling you what you have to do. You instruct the tutor to give you the right feedback, the kind of feedback you want, when you want it, because constant interruption. Mm -hmm not the best. And then you design a system where you record the conversation and you go through the conversation, possibly even stop in the conversation and go through this conversation again. So you do not have the pressure of the live, you know, the live events, mm -hmm. so to speak. And that is one, there's many techniques, many, many, there's a lot. It depends on the point of the learning curve uh, at, at which you find yourself in the learning curve. But I, I have figured out that in order to get out of wherever point you find yourself at, you have to uh, uh, to work along these lines. Uh, get out of your comfort zone. Uh, record the conversation. If you if you're speaking, record the conversations. Get a great attitude. Find a nice person to work with. If, if a person refuses to, and that has happened, is is real. Like you find a you find a teacher, and the teacher thinks that they know better, so they have to impose their oh let's do some grammar or let's read out loud. You just like you have to find someone else. And then basically you can develop these skills for everything, for reading, for speaking, for listening, for writing. And that is what takes you to the next level. Right now, I am, I think, at a B2 in Polish. I've been in Poland a number of times. Polish is an integral part of my life uh, here for personal reasons. And I know that in order to reach a C1, I have to do some deliberate work that is not what I've been doing so far. Because what I've been doing so far is like interacting with people, speaking on the phone, etc. But it, it has a limit. The B2 is the level where you can function in a society. But being able to pass a C1 exam, which is what I want to do within this year, maybe next year, means a number of other skills. If you know the kind of skills that uh, you want to develop, you also know, okay, in order to develop this skill, what you have to do is you work, you have to work on that skill. There's a, a book that is called Ultra Learning. I don't know if you ever heard of, uh, of it. Oh, by so. uh, who actually also, <clears throat> Ultra Learning, he also, uh, this guy with another guy, they had this uh, very cool language uh, challenge where they were forced to speak. They went through like four continents. Kore they learned Korean, I think Chinese, Spanish, and French, if I'm not wrong, I, they could not speak English. Ultra learning is about not only about language learning, but it shows the power that people have when you just engage in very intensive delivery. Mm -hmm. The problem here is that, and that's also the reason why most people reach B2, they won't go further, is because once you reach B2, your brain, we have to remember that we live in a 21st century technology with bodies that were the same 200,000 years ago or even more, mm -hmm. and the, our biological tendency is to save energy. So if you're telling someone you have to do the hard work and you have to make your, your, your brain work more, most people will try to look for the, the, the best way to avoid spending energy. And the, the only people, the, the people who get a, to a very high level are those who are willing to spend a little bit more mental energy because for whatever reason, their personal reason, their own personal reason, they want to, um, you, they want to get to that level. That is a minority of a minority because the people who get to a very high level, they most often than not do it also because they have to do it for work, for personal reasons. If you want to be a university professor and then you want to learn Danish to that level, you have to do it. But there's a minority of a minority who, like, like me, they want to reach this level without really needing it. I don't need to speak um, uh, Polish like a native, but I want to do that because I know that once I do that, my understanding and my my ability to blend in the environment is gonna is gonna multi, is gonna multiply tenfold, or, and that is in and of itself a big reward for me. But I totally understand that most people would not go for that. I think the B B two is already a great achievement in any language you speak. But if you are really serious in general, uh, 
especially when you hit the, the B2 plateau, moving from B2 to C1, it entails um, attitude. You have to, to know exactly why you're doing that. You want to have to, you want to, you want to do it. And you have to design strategies that are aimed at skill growing because it's not just about the knowledge. It's first and foremost about the skills. And that's what, unfortunately, our system all across the world, the educational system is lacking. We develop knowledge. We know a lot about a language. Just to give an example mm-hmm. about specific about language learning, this entails everything else. And the, the skill building is really lacking. In particular, uh, this guy in, in the book, Peak, uh, talks about that, that entire systems, entire uh, in America, in the U.S., uh, I don't remember exactly the university, they have designed a completely different uh, system based on problem solving to help people develop the, the right skills in, in maths and physics. Most people think that they're either good at math. How many times have we heard, I'm good at math? Oh, that guy is a math genius. Mm-hmm. No, I think it's all about, of course, there are some inevitable um, differences in our brain. Some people might be a little bit smarter than others or a little bit, they have a knack for something. But the reality is, and I believe that um, right now, even more than before, is that we are all able to become the much better version of ourselves if we know how to do it and if we if we know why we do it and, and we put the time and the effort. That's everybody can learn a bunch of languages. Everybody can learn to learn to learn the guitar, uh, learning to be very good in math. Um, everything is possible. It's just it's it's a fulfilling prophecy when we have limiting we we all have limiting beliefs that limit our lives big time without knowing that until someone tells us otherwise, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I totally agree with everything you said. And one of the things you just touched on was how you're you're one of the, the people who exist in the minority of wanting to take one language as far as possible. And I that's something that we both share. And so I want to come back to that in a second. But one other thing that I wanted to ask you about when you were talking about the, the process of deliberate practice, especially when it comes to going from that B2 level to the C1 level, mm-hmm. where, you know, it can be... You, you might have to really do something like set up a, t- uh, a lesson with a tutor and isolate things you want to improve on and, and get that feedback. But one piece that I didn't really hear you talk about, but I have found that is really important for me is once you find out things that you need to improve about your speech or that you want to change about your speech, that having that knowledge alone sometimes isn't enough. Sometimes I have to go back to the input and actually get more input so that I can build more of an intuition or surrounding that. And if I just try to use the knowledge alone to change the way that I speak, it can actually sometimes end up becoming unnatural or maybe I'll overcorrect in certain areas and things like that. And so uh, what do you feel about that? I am just, I'm not very good at at drawing, but this is not a drawing, but just to to show you what, here, I am not sure that this is going to be visible, but imagine the sub, okay, so for the sake of simplicity, these are the four sub skills, right? Reading, listening, speaking, and writing. I Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that, and that's one thing that I wanted to tell you, but I forgot, <laughs> I was caught at the moment, is that all these skills are interconnected. They're surprisingly, they can be like, they, sometimes we misunderstand how these skills work within our brain because we think, oh, well, I cannot listen, but I can speak. So maybe these are, are not connected. They are connected and disconnected at the same time. So if you think about it, we, we have four channels to develop to the, to all of these skills. Like the eyes, we, we, learn, um, we learn how to read through our eyes. We learn how to listen and understand the language through our ears. We learn to speak through our mouth. And we learn to write through our hand and through our brain, obviously. But 100 years ago, it's very common. We tend to forget about this, that it's, very, it's still the case in Italy, in some parts of Italy, probably in the United States as well, that some people are able to speak the language and they can understand the language, but they cannot read or write, the so-called analphabets, right? And that goes to show that you can develop one skill uh, to the detriment of another. You can learn to speak, but you, if you never learn how to read, uh, well, you, you will never learn how to read. In, in first language acquisition, we first learn to, the very first thing that we do is we, tr- we listen, we hear stuff around, then we try to bubble words, then we learn to read, and then we learn to write later. That's implicit learning first and explicit learning later. But when we learn a second language, well, the question is, where do you start? Do you start by reading? Do you start by listening? Do you start just listening just by reading? Well, if you learn a second language just by reading, you will not understand anything. If you learn a language just by listening, you will not be able to read or possibly even to write. 
or and so I think that um, what you need to do is it's it's a very important component is when you develop speaking when you want to improve in your speaking you have to develop all these four skills at the same time so that they create a compound effect so when you speak you have to make sure that you go back reading because speaking uh, you know when when you speak and you make a mistake or you try to say something you can't say you just discover a gap then when you take a look at when you read you will be more conscious about that kind of gap that you had by reading and reading helps uh, speaking speaking helps writing writing helps thinking and so it's very important that if you want to bring it to the next level you have to have a strategy in place that it entails and encompasses all four skills in my specific case and this for this specific challenge I want to, if I want to pass the C1 exam, I've downloaded a bunch of exams to have an idea of the kind of exam I have to do. But this is more for me. It's just, you know, an exam is just an excuse, a test that I want to pass to to improve. I've just figured out, okay, Luca, in order to uh, learn to to, in order to improve all these four skills, you have to design. Okay, how do I design a strategy for reading? But also, how do I develop a strategy? that links reading with listening, with speaking, with writing, et cetera. So my, my strategy is a strategy where all these skills are somehow interconnected and I make sure that I, I, I work on them uh, at the same time and I know what to do. In the case of um, a specific case of Polish, if I have to speak now, I, for example, I have a converse, conversation every day, I speak Polish all the time and it's an everyday conversation. but one thing that you want to develop is your capacity to deliver three minute speeches in a clear way. That's a skill in and of itself. You want to describe an image in Polish. So, you know, the descript descriptive language entails another set of skills. So you want to develop these skills, but also again, you want to, you want to connect them with, uh, with input. And of course, I won't improve my speaking just through speaking. You need to read. You need to watch movies. You can just a very, um, a very simple example of how you can connect listening with speaking. You can watch a movie. You can imitate actors. You can imitate short snippets of movies. And I used to do that all the time in American English and French. Uh, or you can just listen to a speech of three minutes and then give a summary of that speech. You're doing. You're developing both. And every single action that you do entails a different skill that you develop that forms the so-called compound effect. Because come to think of it, speaking when we when we use this term speaking a language, the reality is that speaking a language is a very broad term that contains hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of different skills, sub skills, reading out loud, reading, uh, speaking out loud, delivering speeches. Uh, speaking publicly, speak, talking to someone, even speaking in everyday life with someone entails a certain amount of skills that some people have and some people don't. Reading signs, reading facial features, you name it. You know, So you have to learn holistically in order to build these skills that will have this compound effect and hopefully you can reach a higher level and then a higher level and then, you know. You yeah, can yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I especially like what you said about how through speaking, you might discover that there's a gap, but to fill that gap, you actually have to go and read more or listen more. Because if, if, if it's a gap, by definition, something is missing and you can't make that something up. Otherwise, it's going to differ from the way that the language is, is properly spoken by native speakers. And so that's, I think there, there's really a distinction that it's important to make between those gaps and then implicit knowledge. Sometimes through getting a lot of input, you have implicit knowledge, but you aren't quite able to actually make use of that knowledge when you speak or write because you haven't had the practice to really kind of hook up all the connections correctly and activate it. And so that is a matter of practice. And a lot of times people do need to actually do more speaking practice to get their level up. But when there are gaps in your knowledge, then those have to be filled through input. And so um, that's one of the, I think the most useful roles of output at a high level is discovering your gaps so that you know what to do with your attention. It goes back to the mindfulness as yeah, well, exactly. right? So that you know what to be mindful of exactly. when you are getting input. And another thing I want to add is that, <clears throat> I don't know if you ever heard this so-called 10,000 hour rule. So mm -hmm. they say that you have, whenever you spend, you have to spend at least 10,000 hours to, to become good at something. I think that it's true up to a certain point. Uh, that is, you have to spend a lot of time but you also have the quality of your time makes a huge difference. 
Um, and by quality of, of your time, I mean, one thing is just to give an example, to watch a movie just for the sake of watching it. Another is when you watch it with the sake of improving or maybe identifying some words that you don't know. Another thing is take no, you know, take some notes. Um, and I think you can do all these things. I think all of these are good, uh, both watching a movie for the sake of watching it, but also doing some deliberate practice. I distinguish it, you know, I, I make this distinction. But I think that the quality of your time plays a huge role too. So quality coupled with quantity. Quantity is great and it's a base, uh, but also quality and that is the thing that allows you to move from one from one tier, from one level to the other. If you keep doing, Einstein used to say it's folly to expect different results when you do the same thing over and over. So if mm -hmm. if you keep talking, if I if I kept speaking Polish the way I'm doing it right now. I would surely become more fluent in the sense that, it, that my thoughts would roll out of my tongue in a, in a smoother way, but I'm not sure that will refine my speech. So I, I need some other strat to design some other strategies in order to, uh, to move up, to climb the ladder. Unfortunately, it doesn't, it's not that obvious that the more you speak, the better you become. Yes and no, it, it, up to a certain point, because the brain as the body adapts it, it like it adapts to a certain situation doesn't improve unless you want to uh you 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 use your pre your operative center your prefrontal cortex to uh drive it and to force it a little bit into um unknown ground that's the reason why a lot of people who reach a b2 level and function in a society and they're quite happy with what they can do they do not climb the ladder because they don't need to and on the other hand their brain is not you know, that happy to comply, so to speak. So that's, that's the reason why. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, especially that point you brought up about how just doing more speaking practice, it will make you better in a sense, it'll make you more fluent, but not necessarily more native like. And I think a good framework for that is, is this idea of an interlanguage, right, which is this linguistic concept that refers to the version of your target language that exists within your mind. So unless you are already at a, a near native level, your interlanguage is going to differ from the interlanguage of native speakers. Your version of the of the language is almost like your own unique dialect, yeah. which is different. And so practicing speaking a lot without having this deliberate uh, practice factor is going to make you more fluent in your own interlanguage, but it's not going to make your interlanguage become closer to the interlanguage of a native speaker. And it's yeah. easy to, to verify this by just looking at foreign speakers of a language that have lived in a country for 10 years and speak it every day, it still might make very basic mistakes in grammar, pronunciation, things like that. Yes. I mean, it, 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 it's, I think it's very complex because you could reach the level of a native uh, just by talking to people, but that wouldn't be a very high level. Meaning the, the, the thing is that what is, I, I recently made a video about it. What does it mean to speak a language like a native? A na like being a native is a is a matter of identity. It doesn't say much about the proficiency of a person. If you if you if you take a farmer, I was crucified for saying uh, what what is it that I said? I said um, peasant. You don't use peasants. <laughs> I said farmer. Okay, if you take a farmer, uh, with all due respect, it might, might be an uneducated person, and you say, well, he's a native English speaker. He's a French native French speaker. Yes, but that means that if a person, if a foreigner spends all their life talking to this guy, they will learn how to speak like him, which, uh, you know, so it depends on the kind of model you have. If you want to speak like a net, you have, if, if we want to design, I, I think if you want to design strategies or systems, we have to have some sort of goal in mind. We have to have it clear. What is it that you want to achieve? Do you want to speak like, um, I don't know, a farmer? Do you want to speak like a na an, an educated native speaker? Do you want to speak like there's, so many ways of using your own native language. But obviously, I think that when people talk about getting to a native level, they refer to getting to the level where you can express yourself in a very refined and elegant way, etc. Mm -hmm. But come to think of it, if you have, if you let, I don't know, if you test 100, 1,000 Americans, 1,000 Italians, if you try to have them pass the C1 or C2 exam, they're going to have it, it's, it's, they're going to struggle because these exams... Uh, which are not necessarily, uh, you know, do not reveal, as you as you can imagine, if, if a guy goes there and doesn't pass the exam, doesn't mean that they're, they suck in their own native language, even, you know, an Italian, an American, Native American. No, it means that some things, some skills that they probably develop at school, they forgot about it, give them a presentation, make a summary of the stuff. This is stuff that we did when we were at high school, at university, um, and we tend to forget. So, 
we also have to decide, also have to define what, what, what is it that I want to achieve. In my case, my specific case, when it comes to Russian or when it comes to Polish or other languages, I want to be able to express myself at a very high level in a straightforward way and in a, in a concise way. And that entails a lot of work. I've been working on my English for a long time. And back in the day when I was, when it, when I made uh, YouTube videos, I don't think I had the level that I have today because I've been, I've been, I, I told myself, I want to speak English really well. You can tell that I'm a foreigner. It doesn't matter. To me, it's more, the, the most important thing is to get your point across, to be clear, to understand all cultural cues, et cetera, et cetera. But they even thought about creating another term, D1 and D2, for people who are not native, but reach a level that might trump the level of some natives. And that's, that's a, people are very, not conservative, but they're very jealous of their own, uh, you know, identity. So when someone says, oh, he speaks like a native, what do you, what do you mean? You also have, uh, most of the time you have a very negative reaction because they, they think that you're attacking mm -hmm. their identity. Well, it's just a matter of language proficiency. So in my case, when I define um, a goal, my goal is not in all languages, truth be told, I, I can't achieve that in all languages in one lifetime, or I could, but that would, uh, would, would entail draconian measures. Um, and, uh, for me, it, it, in, in some languages, I want to speak really well. And by really well, I mean to speak at an educated level where I can discuss, uh, a number of things, a huge variety of things. And in order to do that, I know exactly what to do, but it takes a long time and it takes a lot of, you know, uh, willpower and takes a lot of designing and some it's for some people, some people love it. Some people do not want to achieve it. I think that if you want to do that, it's totally feasible. We're equipped with a, an amazing machine within our skull. Uh, some people decide to use it. Some people never decide to use that, to that properly. And it's totally up to you. You know, I, I, I totally understand that I'm a, call myself a language buff and I love languages, but I totally understand if a person wanting to learn, say, Japanese will not, we want to be able to communicate and will not be able to speak like a native. For you, it's important. For me, it's important. For other people, it's not that important, but the, 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 the thing here to keep in mind is that if you want to do that, you can do that, learn how to do it, develop the right mindset and spend the time and make the effort and you're going to get there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on that note, talking about how, you know, we happen to be two people who are very passionate about reaching extremely high levels, higher than most people really bother to, to really try to pursue. And so kind of taking that same point, but approaching it from a different angle, Subjectively, what have you found the value of various different levels of language ability uh, has been for you personally? Like, uh, you know, some people say that after having reached different very various levels in languages that the B2 level provides the most bang for your buck in terms of time versus value that you derive, right? And there's this idea of the 80-20 rule where you can get 80% of the benefits by just putting in 20% of the work if you focus on the highest yield kind of portion. So... Has that been your uh, experience? Because some people also, one other just thing to throw in is that some people might see our uh, language pursuits and just think that we have a giant ego and that's why we want to be so good. And it's, there's not, it's not practical and there's no value and things like that. Oh boy, there's so many things to say. <laughs> I think that the real fun and the, the really enticing and enriching part of language learning happens after you develop this beat. Again, we're using a label sweat for a framework for having um, a consistent framework or framework and frame of reference. I think that the most enriching part of language learning happens once you, um, you know, you stop scratching the surface and you get into the deep ocean of, language learning because language learning is so many more things than just speaking a language. It's, it's a, it's a, an infinity of small little things that make your life uh, richer. And uh, in my experience, speaking a language, I can talk about the uh, trivial things like finding a job, which is great. I mean, that language learning allowed me, for example, for, for one to, to have a wonderful job that I have to talk about language learning and the power of self-education. But the reality is that when you speak a language at a very high level, it's a, a really rewarding experience because of how natives treat you. You perceive, it's like taking a glimpse of how your life would be if you were born in that country. It is not mm. trivial to say that it's like living multiple lives. Obviously, you cannot sit, you can only vaguely emulate the existential path of a person because if 
I, I started learning French when I was 10 at school, but I cannot go back and learn. I can, I, I, I spent a lot of time in France. I, I spent a lot of time with a French family. I had a French girlfriend. I went to French school, but I can only vaguely replicate, emulate the a native speaker being born in the country, interacting with parents, etc. But it's a good replica. It's a, it's a good replication. It's, it's just like living a second life in another country. That was the impression I had because in, in France, people treat, treated me like a, like a French person, I lived the French culture, watching movies with uh, Agnès' parents. Agnès was my ex-girlfriend, talking to her. It was like really discovering another reality. And I said, "Wow!" Like I was, I was really surprised that I was living another in another world. That that was really rewarding. I I don't think I would have had all that if I had spoken French to a B two level. Because the reality is that sure, it all comes down to what do you want to do in life. You want to communicate. You want to have. A very good friend level in French uh, or in English or any other language for that matter in order to function in society that's one thing but for me it has given me so many opportunities I, I met an, in, in terms of relationship a love friendship and also as I said uh, at the beginning it's a um, it's a personal growth I've, I've been uh, able to read literature in these languages and uh, and mind you uh, make no mistake, reading a reading a book in a in a in a foreign language directly is a different experience. And watching movies, it's it's been incredibly rewarding, especially when everything becomes automatic and you stop learning a language. Well, you never stop learning a language, but you start using a language and you keep learning by using that language. So it's been an incredibly rewarding experience, also in terms of understanding who I am as a citizen of the world. I'm not I. We hear so many times saying, I'm Italian, I'm French, I'm this and that. I'm a human being, first and foremost. I understood that, that the entire value of, you know, we, I think that in our society, we have some sort of social programming where we're taught that we are Italian first, Roman first, Italian, and then you have the other countries. The reality is we're all on the same boat. And I think that when you have this level of awareness, it comes from also a high, when you reach a high level in a language, when you break the B2 barrier, you start seeing things that you didn't see before. I start things, see things in parties, for example, my awareness of how people interact, uh, people from different cultures, facial features that in misunderstandings, or it's incredible. You can, it's, it's like the matrix. Imagine like <laughs> me start seeing how the reality really is. Well, every other person is unaware of that. So you see, of course, I see a tiny glimpse uh, a little bit more than the common the, the common person, the average Joe, that doesn't make me an, better in any way. But it makes me, I feel like a more, you know, aware uh, individual. And I think that I like thinking that individuals are the atoms of society, of the of this, you know, societal tissue, of the fabric of our society. And if, if, if all individuals are multilingual, they are more patient, they understand you under through language learning, you understand the value of patience, of discipline, of uh, cultural uh, and differences, of traditions, you learn to respect others. And as an individual, you respect other individuals within your society, you form a better society, which interacts better with other societies. And w together, we can literally build a better world. That's why I believe in the mission of not just language learning. Language learning is just one part of what I think is much more important, and that is self-education. That's why I truly treasure education and self-education. Uh, I was recently in, in Bergamo, in northern Italy, uh, giving a speech to 500 kids, and I told them, kids, just like throw away that phone that you're looking at right now and just start learning languages. And there were a few very, you know, this was a linguistic, a liceo linguistic, because they, they did languages. It was mainly uh, for languages. I, I think some of them understood. We spend so much time, uh, you know, doing stuff that is completely uh, useless. And I'm not just saying learn languages, learn stuff, you know, learn to be the better version of yourself. Yeah, totally. And if you speak languages at a very high level, at, you it's it's already in and of itself is a great thing that you speak a B2, don't, don't get me wrong. But if you break that barrier, the rewards are amazing. And once you see what that entails, you will want to learn more and more language. That's the reason why I learn a lot of languages because I see that my life is getting better and better. My mental, uh, my mental life, not only my, my, my life is like when I travel, everything is easier. It's my mental percept. It's my perception of the world that is getting better. So that's, yeah, su such an awesome answer that makes me re-motivated to be more passionate about studying Japanese and 
really living it fully, you know, and seeing seeing how far I, I can take it. Because yeah, all the things you said have have been my my experience as well. And so on, on that note, another thing that I wanted to ask you is so as someone who has um, at least practiced 14 languages, obviously, you can, like you said, it's not really feasible to try to take all of those to, the, you know, to the farthest level possible. So how do you decide which languages you're going to really go all the way with, so to speak, and which ones you are OK getting to a B2 level with or maybe some some languages that you just want to just get a little bit of a taste of how the grammar and things work like that. It's a, it's an excellent, that's an excellent question. I would say that I would, as I would like, if I, if I had the time, cause I'm limited in time and space, I would learn every language to a very high level. Unfortunately you have to make decisions. I think that I don't, I don't make conscious uh, choices, meaning that all the languages that I speak at a very high level are languages. It was more dictated by the circumstances of, of, of my life, meaning that, in American English, well, English is ubiquitous. You, you find it everywhere. So that's one. It's an exception, I would say. But French, I met a French. Uh, I, I had a French girlfriend. I went to live in, in France. So for me, reaching that level was, uh, you know, I, I had to function at a very high level because I went to this interpreting school and knowing French well, not just speaking French, but knowing French well was a must. So for a number of circumstances, living there, having to learn French at a very high level. Well, I just I didn't even decide. It just happened. Um, when it comes to Spanish, I just started learning Spanish in 1999 and then, you know, Spain is because of the vicinity, uh, the proximity of Spain and because there's a lot of uh, native Spanish speakers, I ended up living with a bunch of native, uh, native Spanish speakers and I, I use the language daily. It's like Italian. It's like I use it every, every single, every single day. And that, you know, uh, for me, it's almost a necessity. And I wanted to take it to the next level because I've been teaching Spanish for like 10, the last 10 years. And then um, for other languages like Russian, I had a Russian girlfriend. So uh, having Russian, uh, having girlfriends helped, <laughs> having a partner helped. And I, I, I was there a number of times and I wanted to take it to the next level because it was another important language. So there are some languages, there's like seven or eight languages for which um, I, because of life circumstances, because I, I I knew that I knew that I would use them sooner or later. Um, I just told myself this is going to be this is going to be useful. English, well, Italian, obviously my native Italian, English, French, Spanish, German, Russian, Polish, and there's another one, but I forgot. I don't <laughs> remember. There's eight that I use <clears throat> almost on a daily basis, and um, I I want to take these level take these languages at this uh, at the, to the next level. Then I wait for circumstances in life to change. And if by any chance uh, the next, I don't know, I, for whatever reason, I have to say move to Hungary, then now that I have a B1, B2 level in, in Hungarian, then that is the, that is the push that is going to, you know, not force me, that's going to entice me to learn uh, to, the ne to, the, to the next level, to C1. Uh, but until it is, you know, until I move to a country, I find um, a partner or I find a good friend I'm going to spend a lot of time with, I tend to reach at least a B2 level because I know that if I don't, the language will, will, will shrink. There is a point where if you do not develop the language to a certain point, that's why I call it core. If you don't develop a language core, it shrinks. So if you learn a language for two months and then you don't touch it, then it shrinks and you can barely remember. I did this for mm -hmm. Romanian and it shrank and I could, I can barely remember because this language core is made of not only linguistic structures, but it's a, and there are experiences, uh, structures, sounds all entangled in one, in one, uh, uh, you know, inside the, your brain circuitry. That's why when I learn a language, I don't dabble. I just decide I reach at least a B2 level and I wait for life circumstances to dictate or tell me it's time to move on and, and to climb the, the, the ladder and to take this to the next level. Uh, having said that, the more languages you speak, that's a problem of the so-called polyglots of these people who speak a bunch of languages. And the more languages you speak, the more challenging it becomes to maintain these languages. Mm. So I've just figured out, I have designed a system to keep meticulous track of all the languages and everything I do during the day. Um, and I've figured out that in the last year, for example, I've been using an average of between five and ten languages every day because... <laughs> Because I have this, I have made some very conscious decisions. Otherwise, I will never be able to do that. For example, 
in, in, the, in the household and in the apartment, I speak French, English, and Russian. Then in my private life, I, oh, I coach in uh, other six or seven languages in all possible combinations. And then obviously, uh, you know, I, I speak uh, Polish and I speak Russian. I tend to use uh, these languages a lot. And um, it's funny, on a funny note, that Italian is my native language. I'm in Rome, but I speak Italian maybe 10% of the time. And English has taken over maybe 60% of the time. Then you got 30% the other language, 40%, no, 30%, and then 10% Italian. I read a lot in Italian, especially the newspaper, but I don't speak it that much. And you can get rusty in your own native language. Rusty meaning not as precise as before. I was much more precise when I was doing the interpreting school because I was forced to. They told us that uh, the most important language we have in our language uh, budget, so to speak, under our belt is actually our native language as interpreters. But that's, that's I've designed my life to, to learn, to, to, to be able to speak and practice and listen and read and write uh, a number of languages that ranges from five till 10. Without that conscious decision, because I was uh, mm -hmm. into a, an engineering, I, I'm originally, I have a degree in engineering, I would have done, I would not been able to um, keep up with that. It's impossible. It, 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 it just, it just uh, requires too many mental, uh, mental, mental stamina resilience. You, you can't do that unless you reach a B2 and then it, things get a little bit easier to maintain, not to improve. There's a maintenance mode and an improving mode. There's two different modes, deliberate and, and a natural practice. And that's how I live. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm curious about this kind of system that you said that you you've built up to help you maintain all these languages, like two things. One is it kind of sounds like maybe perhaps you've put in some parameters so that you can live more organically while still making sure that you have a lot of exposure to the different language, like with your roommates, how you know you're going to end up talking to your roommates and you're going to use these different languages. And so it's kind of a more natural way to make sure you use them versus like having an alarm, like beep, beep, oh, time to do Spanish now, you know? Well, so yeah, is there some of that as well? Or how does it work? I don't want to, I, I mean, it doesn't, the, the, the thing I always say, I don't know if you ever heard of Mezzofanti. Mezzofanti is this very famous Italian polyglot who's supposed to be the, the best polyglot in history, who used to speak, I don't know, third, between 32 and 70 languages fluently, they say, or he claimed, I don't know. Um, but Mezzofanti, at the end of his life, ended up speaking in tongues, as they say, and he was just speaking for the sake of it. He was going crazy. And there's a very important thing that I want to stress for all the people who are listening to us and want to become polyglots or already are polyglots. Do not get obsessed with language learning. Language learning is, has, to be, has, to, has to be at your service. You don't have to be at the mercy of languages. When language learning becomes an obsession that you, oh, it's, it's, it's too, I have to do this, I have to do that, then it becomes dangerous. So I also, in a way, I'm, I'm, it's a good obsession but I was a little bit, when I started making YouTube videos and people started following my channel, I, I got very kind of obsessed for a couple of years. So I was trying all my best to learn as much as I could. And then I realized I have to design a different system. I have to like, let language learning become a consequence of my lifestyle and not the other way around. I don't want to bend my life, my lifestyle to language learning. So basically I have set, I have set up a number of habits that allow me to um, practice languages without being too obsessed with by it and say, oh, I have to do that. I keep track of that. That's one thing. And the other thing I do is that I have mm, connected some habits that I have with some other language habits. Just to give an example, uh, when it comes to my personal routine, regardless of my uh, flatmates, when I take a shower, for example, if I do some workout in the morning and I take a shower, all that time is dedicated to listening to Polish. So I know that when I start doing some workout and or I go running, for example, and then I take a shower, that's that's a space. I know that that's a, a habit that is defined by time, space, and, uh, and and another action. That's the time when I listen to Polish. When I cook, I I listen to to Russian. When I read, I, I read in say German or other languages. I do a number of things that I don't even think about it. I just I just do it, you know, instead of just doing stuff just in one language. Um, and then obviously this is the, the, the part of leisure time, so to speak, the time that I have for myself. Um, but then when I coach, of course, I have to speak English, Spanish, German, mm -hmm. Russian, all these languages. So that's, you know, at least two or three hours a day. That's another time that, you know, I, 
I, it's just work uh, and I have to speak these languages. And then with my flats, uh, flatmates, it, it, it just, I don't impose anything. If they want to speak English, for example, uh, there's a girl from Kazakhstan. If she wants to speak English because there's other people around who do not understand Russian, then we speak English. Sometimes we speak Russian. Sometimes we speak French. As it goes, I have a number of people just coming and going so I can practice languages um, on a whim, so to speak. Now I'm speaking a lot in French uh, because there's a French guy in the apartment, so we spend time, you know, chatting, etc. But it depends. It depends on it changes. Um, but I do. Uh, so I, I spend a lot of time in my micro environment that is in my apartment, speaking languages, the living situations here, and um, you know, coaching. So speaking languages at work, and I read a lot. So I, I tend to read everything that comes to mind. Now you cannot see it, but I. You know, I have I have my pile of books that I read. So I read one in in various languages. I I'm I go with the flow and I go with the content. I don't care so much about the language. I care about the book that I'm reading. And if it happens to be in Russian or in English or in German, that's fine. I don't I'm not like oh I have to read 30 minutes of this, 30 minutes of that. Otherwise, it becomes an obsession and and it consumes your life. You you don't want to do that. Another thing that I did uh, that I think is very useful is I really curbed the amount of time that I use in social media. So Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram, I mean, I spend, I spend time in a, in a, in a valuable way. I've just, I, I've realized how valuable time is and how much time we spend, we waste on stuff that is strictly not necessary. And it doesn't even give me pleasure. It gives me <laughs> the dopamine because it's a, the, the entire system is based on dopamine, but my language learning or reading books, gives me a, a completely different uh, dose of dopamine. And that's the speech I gave to these kids, like forget about your phone. I'm not sure that they listen, but they, because they're deep in it. But it's like one of the things that I highly recommend when it comes to language learning and learning effectively is focus. And focus is a luxury that a lot of people do not have nowadays because they're completely sucked in in this uh, – uh, unfortunately, very addictive system, mm -hmm. but it's the internet and everything else that surrounds us, the internet, computer, iPad, uh, phone, and that hampers us from learning effectively. How many times, for example, people learn through their phones and they have a lot of notifications here and there. It, it, it takes 10 seconds to get, to get back on track after you get distracted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one thing that I've, that I, I feel it's a very important piece of advice is, before learning anything, or if you want to improve uh, upon something, make sure that you clean your desktop, you clean your mind, you are aware, and you curb and you try to diminish or you try to eliminate, if you can, all possible distractions because that keeps you from learning well. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's also another thing that meditation can be really helpful for is yes. increasing your focus and concentration and building up a little bit more resistance against the temptations to do something that's going to get you off track and stuff. But just so. if, if you think about it, think right now about the things you're doing. Maybe you're watching this interview and maybe you're like opening other tabs. You're doing something else. You're looking at your phone. You've probably done it. I mean, I, I doubt there is someone who's going to watch the entire thing just sitting here. They might, be watching, <laughs> they might be listening to it, but it's really difficult to focus. But if you made – if you, for example, decided that this interview was a piece of valuable piece of content, one thing that you could do is you could put this – this is just a basic piece of advice. Put it on full screen. And, and take a piece of paper and jot down notes. You will see how much your brain is going to focus on because it has to process the information. You have to summarize it or maybe you have to rephrase the pieces of information that we are throwing at you. And you will see how much this is going to stay in your head instead of just watching it you know, while doing something else or, or being distracted by your phone. And that's really important. That goes for language learning as well. I've been – I was sucked in – the 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 Facebook rabbit hole, the the Instagram, Instagram not that much, but for when I started making YouTube videos, I do remember between 2008 and 2011, I spent a lot of time, um, you know, trying to learn languages, but in a very disordered way. It was like oh, opening this and opening that, and you know, the FOMO they call it, the fear of missing out. So I was trying to do everything, and as a result, I was not really learning. I was spending a lot of hours, but in a very inefficient way. Now I spend less hours learning, deliberately learning languages, but in a, a very conscious uh, way. And that is skyrocketing my, my language, uh, language learning curve. And the return of investment is huge. But 
I had to work on myself first on my impulses because I'm a human being and I work on my brain works on dopamine too. So sometimes I find myself opening 3000 tabs and doing this and doing that. Then I say, calm down, you know, take, take, take a moment and restructure your learning and, and whatever else. You know? Yeah, totally. No, good advice. Like I'm, I'm benefiting from this as well. I'm seeing myself knowing I still got a lot of room to improve for sure. But Cool. So, I mean, one one just la last question, I guess, because I mean, I'm sure we could talk all day. But uh, so we've been talking for a while. But one last thing that I'm just curious about when you were talking about how you maintain all the different languages, how you mentioned that you have a maintenance mode and then an active improvement mode. And so for the languages that you're already at a near native level, C2 level, whatever, like, you know, French, English and things like that, do you ever put those back into your more active mode for a period of time? Or is it at the point where maintenance mode is all that's ever required? It's a very good question. Um, I would say that I keep improving all the time. I One one thing that I, the attitude that I've developed is like, sometimes you think that you 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 just got it, that you know everything. You We know that we do not know. Socrates used to tell us that. And when I read books, I constantly learn new things, new words, etc. And I have the attitude that even if I think that I can function well in English, there's always plenty to learn. So I always make sure that if, say, I'm watching a YouTube, a YouTube video and I stumble upon a word I don't know, I make sure that I uh, look it up. But all in all, to answer your question, in English, I'm more like into maintenance mode, meaning that I my life is through English. Um, but I have to, for example, I have to do some academic training for uh, writing. I have to train people to write better in English, or I have to speak and tell, train them to give speeches, describe images. That helps me. That helps myself by teaching. You learn. So, in a way, I am constantly improving my English as well because I have to teach uh, pronunciation, intonation. But I would say that the improvement is little when you get up to you know a certain point. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that it's more like maintenance mode for. Uh, for five, four or five languages, it's more maintenance mode. While that's you know the, the kind of mode where you keep consuming, using the language, you do not consciously sit down and you try to improve. For other languages, is is obviously improving mode. Um, and I, I have languages at all levels. So you have the C1, C2, B1, B2, and then you have the A1, A2. So depending on the circumstances, uh, I tend to try to put my energy into the languages that I know of the least. Um, for example, right now, I wake up every day when I, when I can. Uh, today, I did three hours. I did one hour of Greek, one hour of Danish, and one hour of, um, we had three. <laughs> Greek, uh, Greek, Danish, and another one that for some I've been talking too much, so it's not coming. <laughs> Let me see here. Oh, Hungarian. I just looked there. So I did three hours, and I spent some deliberate time uh, learning, etc. It was really rewarding, but I don't do that for English, French, or Spanish, or German, uh, or for Russian. You know, uh, even Polish. It, I, it's in maintenance mode right now. I'm very happy with uh, how my Polish is. Right, I can function. I can speak. I, I can understand everything. But the time will come when I tell myself, you know, um, I will want to pass a test. And I always tell people that if you wanna, if you wanna motivate you even more. Uh, Passing tests is a great way because even if they're not 100% indicative of your real language skills, they we have to stop looking at tests like something we're scared of. People still mm -hmm. have this; they inherit this mentality. Oh, the test! You know, they see themselves sweating and suffering and being judged by mean, uh, being mean people. Well, the reality is, if you flip things around and if you see tests as learning tools, that's recently I've seen a. a it's an amazing YouTube video, which is called three, uh, three hacks, three learning hacks that actually work from SAP science or something like that. And I completely agree. They talk about that in, in scientific literature. They summed up what you have to do. And one of the things is test yourself. One of the things I forgot to tell you is that one fantastic way to keep improving is testing, but testing the right way, not testing like you take a test and you get judged, mm -hmm. but testing like you, you test, you get the answers and you, you can even look at the answers, uh, directly. You, maybe someone gives you the answers or you can look at the answers, take tests online, search. Um, you can, I don't know, subjuntivo. you have some problems with subjuntivo, and do some testing online and learn to extract patterns from your mistakes. You learn these, um, you learn to use tests as language tools and everything is gonna, is gonna change. 
Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that um, Finland has one of the best, not only language, but educational systems in the world. You can just type Finland best education in the world. Um, and you will see why people do not get tested. Kids choose the, what they want to learn. They're not giving homework and they solve problems. I see language learning as a constant problem solving thing. You give a person a, a problem to solve. They rack their brains trying to understand and try to figure out the problem. Then you might give them the solution, but give them the solution just after they try to rack their, bra their brains to solve the problem. This goes for maths or, or language learning, and instead we're giving knowledge. We're just giving rules, grammar rules, or we're giving words. That's not how language uh, learning in general works. And the, the Finns have figured out before anybody else, you know, so we can change. The only problem is that I'm really passionate about education, you know, self-education. The problem that I see is that this is a this is a system that has been going on for 200 years since the uh, the, mm -hmm. you know, the industrial revolution. It's really difficult to change. But the Internet is changing everything. More and more people are aware mm -hmm. that they're telling themselves, oh, they teach me geography in school. They teach me history and math this way. But there are other ways. And it's up to you to get educated. Just grab books, look for the internet. There's thousands of very good books about education, language learning, how to learn, learning how to learn, you name it, you know, and they all point to the same direction is that if you learn how to uh, learn how to learn, be take initiative, have the right attitude and the limited distractions, you can do, you can do wonders. You can, you can, it can, it can do wonders for yourself and you can, uh, again, you can be the much, much, much better version of yourself in a very short period of time unexpectedly because society tells you that it's not possible. But the reality is you have to listen, start listening to your inner voice and start looking at the evidence that is out there. And that I, I would not go so far as to say that everything is possible, but a lot is possible and it's totally up to you. Awesome. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. I think that's what, and really important for, for people to hear. So, yeah covered a lot of ground and uh, we have yes yeah i think i think this uh, was a really awesome interview uh, i mean i'm the interviewer maybe i shouldn't say that maybe that but um uh, is, uh <laughs> where can uh, people find more of your content okay so you can uh, go to lucalamparello.com where i have my blog and i have also my coaching services i coach people whoever wants to grab a, a package or a coaching session about learning how to learn about learn, learning languages and also my YouTube channel. So uh, if you type Luca Lamparello on YouTube, you will easily find my channel. And I also have uh, Luca Lamparello Coaching on uh, Facebook and on uh, Instagram. But if you find LucaLamparello.com, that's the main website where you can find all the rest. Cool, cool. I'll put links in the description. Awesome, yeah. So thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having and me. It was a real pleasure. Maybe we'll talk again sometime. Sure. <laughs>